and so on. But the problem is we can generate generally only a few numbers of them, like generate or develop in the laboratory 10,000 T cells. But that's not really enough to replace the T cell repertoire in an immunodeficient patient. So the question is, how do we deal with this problem? And we thought about a trick on how to do this. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So, um, so in other words, can we regenerate large numbers of um, T cells from um, embryonic stem cells, which is so far the process is very inefficient. And I will first introduce to you the, um, um, the developmental pathway by which lymphocytes uh, can from a hematopoietic stem cell. So the HSC will develop over time into what is called an MPP. This is a multipotent progenitor cell that is very similar to a hematopoietic stem cell, except that it cannot cell renew. So it's pluripotent. It can still develop into all of these different lineages, but it does not have the ability to asymmetrically divide. From the MPP, then can differentiate a macrophage, a T cell, a B cell, a dendritic cell, a red blood cell, other cell types as well. The T cells are involved in regulating the immune response. The B cells, for example, make antibodies. The dendritic cells present antigen to the T cells and the B cells so they know they have to respond. So the, this process can also be um, the development of lymphocytes can also come from embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells, as discussed before. But again, this whole process is, is limited because there are a couple of bottlenecks. The number of T cells that can uh, be developed from an HSC in culture is, is relatively low, perhaps in the order between 5 and 10,000. So how do we do this? And um, we thought about the following. So normally, when you take the cells out of the bone marrow of a mouse, they will readily differentiate to become B cells. That's the default pathway. That's the pathway they like to go, under the conditions that we call the culture these cells in. So we thought, well, maybe we should be able to prevent them from becoming a B cell. And maybe then the cell will remain pluripotent or multipotent, right? That was the idea. So then, in principle, we could culture these pluripotent stem cells in large numbers, maybe even 100 million or so, that then can be used, ultimately, in humans to, um, for, um, for cell therapy. So how do we do such a thing? So there was a gene, and that gene is known E2A. And that gene in both mice, mice and humans is acquired for the development of B cells. So in mice that lack the E2A gene, these mice cannot um, generate a number of any B cells. But they will develop into, they, they will generate macrophages, T cells, dendritic cells, and red blood cells. So then we thought, well, if we take the bone marrow of these mice that lack this particular gene, and we would culture them in vitro in the presence of cytokines and growth factors, then perhaps a culture would grow out that would remain uh, multipotent. So that would have the ability also in vitro to differentiate into either a T cell, a macrophage, a red blood cell, and so on. So that's what we did. And indeed, um, what we were able to do, we, we, we took the uh, bone marrow of those mice that were genetically modified, so they lacked this one gene. We added the cytokines, and the culture grew out that when we inject, re-injected them into ra irradiated hosts, they could reconstitute the entire hematopoietic compartment except for B cells. So indeed now we have a culture um, that was pluripotent. Now this culture can be grown up to two years, and in principle we can generate a billion cells. From them. They remain pluripotent, that's the important issue. So after two years of culture, we can take those cells, inject them into a radiated host, and they again will reconstitute the entire hematopoietic compartment, except for B cells. So, um, to summarize this, uh, in, the, um, in, in the absence of this particular gene, hematopoietic uh, multipotent progenitors can be grown for many, many generations, so far indefinitely it seems. Um, but when we add the appropriate stimuli, in vivo or in vitro, they will differentiate to become natural killer cells, they will become T cells, dendritic cells, and red blood cells. So now, of course, we have the ability 
to generate large numbers of T cells that can then be injected in, for example, immunodeficient patients. But this was done in mice, of course. Um, now, the next question was, now we have, of course, a genetically modified mouse, but we, uh, it will be difficult to do the same experiment in humans. And so how can we inactivate the E2A gene in, in, in human cells uh, without genetic modification? Now, the nice thing was that natural inhibitors of E2A, of this particular protein, have been identified. So normally the E2A gene is turned on early in B cell development, and then it drives the whole process until the, the B cell becomes mature. And then it's turned off. And it's turned off by a protein called ID, inhibitors of differentiation. So it's a natural inhibitor. It functions in, in the mouse and in humans to turn off the E2A gene once the differentiation process has been completed. So we thought, well, maybe this natural inhibitor of E2A, we can add this to cells, and then it should block, uh, again, the, the differentiation of these multipotent progenitors. So to uh, say a little bit about the ID proteins, here we have the E2A proteins are DA binding proteins. They bind to like 200 genes in developing B cells, and they activate or repress the transcription of those genes. And that makes a B cell a B cell. They don't do this in, for example, T cells. So then, at some point in time, this particular protein called ID1 is turned on. And ID proteins, they can interact with these E2A proteins, but they can not bind to DNA. Thus, by forming this dimer, as indicated here, they inactivate the DNA binding activity of those proteins. So they prevent E2A to induce B cell development if expressed at the wrong time. Normally, they act at later stages. So what we have done most recently, um, this um, grant money supplied by the CERN, we have, in fact, indeed generated long-term cultures by simply overexpressing the ID protein. So it does the same thing as genetic, genetically deleting or ablating the E2A gene from developing B cells. We can simply overexpress ID proteins and again, we can generate a culture in, um, uh, in the laboratory that can be grown for many, many generations and that can be injected into radiated host and reconstitute the compartments. So the next question, of course, is, um, well, now we have done this in mice and will this actually work in humans? So one of the greatest things in biology, I think, in the, in the past century has been the notion that all molecules and pathways are conserved throughout evolution. The molecules that control B cell development in, in mice actually also work in fruit flies to control sex determination and, and, um, and neurogenesis, or certain aspects of neurogenesis. And so, and indeed, the same molecule is present in humans. When overexpressed in a human uh, uh, B cell progenitor, they block the differentiation program exactly the same way as in mice. So now, the next step will be um, to generate the same cultures, multipotent progenitors, from human um, uh, cells, and then um, uh, from there, differentiate them in vitro, uh, generate T cells that, that can be then transferred to immunodeficient patients. Um, T cell receptor genes that recognize specific cancer antigens can be reintroduced into, the, into those progenitors. Um, the cells could become uh, perhaps made um, uh, resistant to HIV infection and then could be um, provided to um, HIV patients. And so I think this is actually quite feasible in the short term. Um, we know it works in mice. We know the same molecule uh, prevents B cell development in humans. And there's actually no reason why this should not work. Thanks very much. So how close are you to being able to initiate human trials? What, what, is, what do you need to do? Oh, um, for the human trials, we will um, need to infect, um, first of all, we will infect human core blood cells with this virus, with the ID virus. Then when that works, um, in principle, this, this should not be too long, which we are initiating right now. Then what we will do is we, we, we have fused the ID uh, protein to a peptide, which allows the protein to uh, penetrate cells. So we would culture the cells then in, an, uh, in the presence of this reagent, simply in the presence of protein, not the virus. We would then cope, and then hopefully the ID protein would inactivate the E2A gene <laughs> product. That actually has worked in mouse B cells, we have done that too. Um, we then would culture the cells, and then in principle, um, 
yes, and it's up to the clinicians to uh, take it from there. Uh, but then, then that's it. That's the only thing we have to do. There's no reason uh, uh, for, there's no further sophistication necessary. We don't need to generate a small molecule inhibitor. We already have the inhibitor that can be introduced into these cells. Yes? So, um, sorry, I didn't get, so the treatment would be treating blood and then putting the blood back into the patient, or would it be um, putting this construct into patients when it gets to a clinical trial? Well, we would never introduce the uh, construct into the patient. Mm -hmm. We would treat them with the protein that contains right, the cell penetrating right. peptide. Well, the, great, uh, the, the idea would be ultimately to use IPS, for example, um, and take a uh, skin cell, um, then uh, let it de-differentiate into becoming a, a, a pluripotent stem cell, and then culture them in, uh, under T-cell promoting conditions in the presence of this ID uh, peptide fusion protein, uh, and then expand the T-cell population derived from those cells. Because then, of course, one would avoid the problem of um, uh, allogeneity. Or rejection. <laughs> that would be the ultimate goal. 